Welcome back, everyone. Today is October 31st, 2022. And I thought there was no better day than to make a video on the Reformation. For those of you who do not know, October 31st is a very famous day. Uh, on the eve or vigil of the Feast of All Saints, or All Hallows' Eve, Martin Luther issued his 95 theses against the abuse of indulgences and the papal support of it. And this launched the process of the Protestant Reformation. And to this day, we remember October 31st as Reformation Day. So I'm going to do an audio briefly about what happened on October 31st, 1517 with Martin Luther in his 95 Theses. And then I'm going to talk about the monumental doctrine of justification by faith. But before I get into that, uh, I have a few announcements that I'd like to make. So first, uh, please, if you can, subscribe. If you have not, like the video, hit the bell for future notifications, and share within your social media. I appreciate all the help I can get to reach more people. The other point I wanted to make is I have a personal friend of mine from, of many years um, who has many children, one of which was recently diagnosed with cancer. And the family is in dire need of financial support. Their little son, Dryden, needs all the prayers he can get. He is responding very well to the chemotherapy. And so all of the doctors have uh, bright expectations uh, to him overcoming the cancer. Um, but he's still not out of the woods and he needs prayers and he, and the family, um, the Stewart family needs all the help that they can get. You can see a link for the GoFundMe in the, uh, show links, uh, below the video, please, if you can, um, support in any way, if you can. All right. So those are the, uh, that's the only announcement I have. Um, but uh, I want to get back to this issue of the 95 Theses. So it's popularly believed that Martin Luther posted uh, his 95 Theses to the front door of the castle church in the Saxon University town of Wittenberg, Germany. And that from there, um, you know, the Reformation kicked off and everybody was uh, starting to believe in justification by faith alone and uh, denying papal authority and all that. There's a lot of mythology behind this, and it, it there's no real concrete evidence other than a widely held legend that Martin Luther actually nailed the 95 Thesis to the Castle Church in Wittenberg. Uh, many Lutherans have claimed that this happened and, and people in the, uh, within the 1500s later on were claiming that it happened, but we don't have any statement in Martin Luther about this event. And anytime he recounts the beginnings of his, uh, his, his penmanship against indulgences and against papal authority, he doesn't mention anything about posting the 95 Theses, as far as I know, and as far as many scholars know. Uh, so what is clear and what he did claim is that on the eve of the Feast of All Saints, he did issue his 95 Theses. And what that means is he probably posted it, um, meaning through mail, to the local bishop of Wittenberg. And... Um, and awaited responses um, to have some sort of uh, a disputation on that. Now, the, the reason why the legend came out that he posted it on the front door is because that was actually a common thing for 
uh, theologians, uh, academics, and scholars to do um, whenever they wanted to engage in a disputation in, in some sort of academic format is that you could post um, a, a, a summons or a notice of disputation on a particular matter, and then they could meet together to discuss and dispute. So that was not uncommon at all. So it, it, there may have been, I mean, Luther may have done it, you know, but it, it, there just doesn't seem to be a lot beyond mythology supporting it. Um, and, and so what we do know is that the 95 theses were written against the abuse of indulgences at that point in time. Martin Luther was uh, very respectful of the papacy. He was not against uh, the sacraments of the church. He, he, he definitely did not know um, the, the full or uh, doctrine of justification as he later defined it at this point in time in 1517. Um, and so in many ways, he was still uh, uh, just a, a Catholic who was disputing something that he thought could be resolved um, with basically correcting the church on the abuses of indulgences. And, uh, of course, what quickly ensued was Martin Luther was, uh, was uh, uh, put under the radar for church discipline. He was immediately into uh, debates. You know, he, uh, he uh, was excommunicated. And, uh, it, you know, it, from there it led on and it just it was like a snowball effect. It just kept growing and growing and growing into what it became. Um, and so the 90, the 95 thesis were not on the, the doctrine of justification. In fact, it was mainly on the doctrine of indulgences. Now I want to talk about justification because that's really where the, the debate goes, um, into the, like the, the core of the differences between, uh, Catholics and Lutherans, um, later that century and be and up to our current day although i don't want to belittle the other arguments that uh, luther had against the against catholic theology he came to he came to dispute um the the schoolmen the medieval schoolmen and their their interpretations of uh, paul interpretations of the bible and, uh, you know, it really centered in on, uh, for Luther anyway, in his own words, he, he really thought that the doctrine of total depravity, the bondage of the will, the enslavement of the human being to sin, that the man, man has no, um, he has no choice but to sin. Um, and, and he did not see a difference between venial and mortal sin um, in, in a way that would uh, uh, support um, the way that the Catholic theologians were teaching on original sin, the fall of man, and how sin relates to the uh, baptismal life of grace. Um, but Luther disputed the Catholic doctrine of free will. That was just, you know, if anybody, if any of you are familiar with the uh, back and forth that went that took place between Luther and Erasmus, you'll see that this issue of the will, what is man free to do? Um, and uh, uh, that was really at the heart. You know, that's more of like the, the theological propeller, you could say, of, of Lutheran theology. And uh, that served as a, a, a propeller for future developments that came later um, in the official documents of the Lutherans that was uh, compiled into the Book of Concord. The, Martin Luther also had a very, very strong, a vehement rejection of the doctrine of the Mass, the sacrificial nature, uh, the propitiatory sacrificial nature of the Mass um, as a real sacrifice uh, in the person of Christ through the priest, um, offering Christ's uh, body and blood, uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation, um, that, that was, uh, you know, in, in, in some places, Martin Luther makes it sound like that was the, one of the most, the, the most ugly abuses of Rome, sadly. 
Um, but the doctrine of justification really was his bread and butter, theologically speaking. And you can see this in his lectures and his commentaries and his uh, letters that sola fide, by faith alone, that man is not justified by works, what he could do for himself, but by faith and faith alone in what Christ has done already for, for human beings on the cross and in the resurrection. So I want to really get into that. I don't plan for this video to be too long. Uh, I just kind of want to touch on some verses in the New Testament where this uh, this debate focuses on and why I think that the Catholic Church is correct on the matter. But before I go on, I wanted to give some book recommendations for those who are interested in future reading. Um, for understanding the history of Martin Luther um, and his, his, his reforms, the Reformation, uh, I recommend Richard Rex, um, The Making of Martin Luther. This was put out by uh, Princeton University Press uh, rather recently. I want to say it was uh, 2017, well, five years ago. Um, Richard Rex did a phenomenal job. You could also get it in Kindle and in audio version on Amazon. For those wanting to understand the Catholic doctrine of indulgences, I would recommend uh, Saint, Pope St. Saint Paul VI's uh, uh, decree. Well, it's not a decree. It's, a, it's a basically a document um, on, indul on the doctrine of indulgences. It was published in 1967. You can get it in, uh, you could read it for free online. Actually, I have a link in the show notes where you could just go and read it. But uh, if you have this, uh, the the first volume of this uh, Vatican collection on the conciliar and the post conciliar documents of Vatican II, um, you can read uh, the um, indul indul indulgentiarum doctrina, the apostolic constitution on the revision of indulgences. Um, and uh, the Pope goes into the theology of indulgences, its origins and its history and its uh, logical coherence with biblical and traditional Christianity. So I recommend Protestants especially, um, but also Catholics to read that to be informed. As, as those uh, who are familiar with the Reformation and Catholic debates, uh, the doctrine of purgatory also took uh, was was center stage in uh, the 1500s, and of course Luther disputed purgatory. Um, if anybody would like to uh, get an introductory book on purgatory from a Catholic perspective, I recommend uh, John Salza, um, the biblical basis for uh, purgatory. Um, it's a very easy read. Uh, he goes through. Uh, an introduction of the theological concepts behind purgatory. And, uh, and later on in the book, he definitely goes through the early church teaching on purgatory. So I, I strongly recommend that as a starter book. And of course, um, uh, for Catholics and Protestants who want to dig a little deeper, I would recommend the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Look under the section of uh, the Sacrament of Penance. And you will find um, what it has to say about indulgences. All right. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to quote Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, this is a rather famous statement of Martin Luther on what he came to see as the uh the beginnings of the uh of of his discovery on the doctrine of justification so if you could see this here on the screen you could read along with me and for those who are just listening um, i'm about to read it so i'll say uh quote i had returned to the psalter to interpret it a second time I had suddenly been possessed with an unusually ardent desire to understand Paul and the epistle to the Romans. But just one phrase in chapter 1 
in the gospel that justice of God is revealed had so far stood in my way. I hated that phrase, justice of God. I felt that before God, I was a sinner with an utterly disquieted conscience, and I could not believe that he was placated but by my satisfactions. I did not love, indeed I hated, that God who punished sinners. Yet I knocked persistently upon Paul in this passage, most earnestly wanting to know what St. Paul intended. At last, I meditated night and day. God had mercy on me. I realized the significance of the context, namely, in it, the justice of God is revealed. As it is written, he who through faith is just shall live. I began to understand that the justice of God meant that justice by which the just man lives through God's gift, namely by faith. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. This passage of Paul became to me a gate to heaven. All right. So anybody who wants to uh, read further on that, um, I got that from uh, Michael Mullet's book on Martin Luther that was published in uh, it was published by Rutledge. So anyway, Martin Luther there is basically saying that the Saint Paul's Epistle to the Romans is where he found uh, paradise because he came to understand that phrase, the justice of God, which in the Greek is dikaiosune tu theu, as a merciful gift of salvation. He claims, Luther does, in, in, in his writings, that the schoolmen and the theologians of his day uh, almost unanimously define justice of God as God's justice against sinners, so punishing his punishing and his his uh, retribution. Now there are some, I think there are some patristic commentaries that interpret it that way, but that's just not uh, defensible. That everyone in the Catholic Church up to his time, or at least within the 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 last part of the 15th century, going into the 16th century, that all Catholics interpreted righteousness of God as his. Uh, Punishing retribution. Yes, there are some commentaries, medieval commentaries, that tie in the the psalmic uh, usage of that um, zedek in the Hebrew root for righteous um, when it's a when it's a, in the genitive of God as His punishing retribution against His enemies. Um, but there are there are a ton of theologians who understood that uh, the righteousness of God in Paul was his redeeming salvific gift of, of righteousness that he gives to sinners. So on that score, Martin Luther was entirely correct. He's, he's not graduating any further than uh, how St. Augustine of Hippo understood uh, the justice of God in, in Romans chapter one. Um, so Martin Luther's discovery there is really a discovery that's still native to the home of Catholic theology. So he really found something that is uh, native to Catholic doctrine. And uh, if you don't believe me on that, just uh, go to the sections on justification in um, the, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and uh, you'll see that um, the, the righteousness of God is defined over and over again as uh as the uh as the saving redeeming gift of uh of forgiveness of sins and and as well as the and, and here I should probably define I should probably define and then so let me just I'm just gonna go there to the catechism and uh and, and read a few of the paragraphs. So I'm gonna read uh paragraph nineteen eighty seven on how uh the Catholic Church understands righteousness of God in her official documents here. So we can see how it actually concurs with Luther's discovery in, uh, in that commentary that we just read. All right, so uh, paragraph 1987 says, 
the grace of the Holy Spirit has the power to justify us. That is to cleanse us from our sins and to communicate to us the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So there we go. It's it's the it's the righteousness of God, um, which gets further defined later. You can see we could see this in uh, uh, paragraph nineteen ninety one. He's, uh, catechism says justification is at the same time the acceptance of God's righteousness, so our acceptance of God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness here means, okay, so this is the catechism of the Catholic Church giving us a definition. Righteousness or justice here means the rectitude of divine love. With justification, faith, hope, and charity are poured into our hearts and obedience to the to the divine will is granted to us. Goes on in paragraph 1992. Justification is conferred in baptism, the sacrament of faith. It conforms us. Baptism conforms us to the righteousness of God, who makes us inwardly just by the power of his mercy. Okay. So we can see there, um, if, if you want to do further reading, Go to the uh, go to paragraphs 1987 and read all the way through to paragraph 2000 in the Catechism, and you'll see that Dikaiosune tu theu, um, or Histusiu Dei, righteousness of God in Latin, justice of God. Uh, Catholics interpret it there in St. Paul's uh, Corpus, Romans 116, especially Romans 116, 17 as the saving righteousness, the delivering righteousness of God, which converts us away from sin and brings us into an interior justice. So it's both the forgiveness of sins, as the Council of Trent t taught, as the Catechism taught, and it's our conforming to the uh, rectitude of divine love. All right, so let me go to um, Romans 1.16. I'll share it on my screen here. Um, I see somebody here. John Doppler Doppler Gondro. Man, when does Eric sleep? <laughs> um, so right now, um, my job, my contract, uh, I work normally um, from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. throughout the week. Um, I, uh, I, well, I can't, I don't want to display, you know, give names of my company I work for, but I fix robots for a client who's operating hours for now at least is uh third shift so the time that i have to on the weekends to do shows like this would be now but i i, I probably gonna i'm probably gonna go to sleep right after the show all right so let me share my screen here and we're gonna go to romans one I'll be gonna, I'll be using the uh, New King James version because uh, Protestants like that translation, and I like that translation too. I have no problem with it. All right, so I'm going to highlight the section here. Paul says, "For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation." For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. So this is the thesis or the thematic content of St. Paul's epistle to the church in Rome. And a couple of observations here will easily show how the way that Protestants eventually came to define justification as uh, an external imputation of righteousness. So when they read, so Martin Luther first saw the uh, Histusio Dei, the justice of God, as a, as a redeeming gift of mercy, which is fine. You know, his, in fact, his lectures on Romans that he did, um, 
it was a couple of years before 1517. Uh, it's actually a pretty good commentary on the book of Romans. There are some things where there are some things you can tell where he's already shifting in a certain direction. But at that point, he's still very much in line with what Trent would have defined as the gift of justification. Um, later on, you know, scholar, historical theologians divide Luther's life into the Catholic Luther, which is there in the beginning. And as he's slowly and more logically plumbing the implications of his doctrine of uh, sola fide, he, he begins to realize that it's necessary to qualify the righteousness that we receive in justification as totally extra nos, meaning totally external to us. Um, and so this is the this is the issue. This is the crux of the difference between Catholics and Protestants on this matter. I very much agree with the late R.C. Sproul in his uh, in his book it was released. It was released quite a bit ago, 1995. His book Faith Alone, where he gets to the to to this crux on the difference between Roman Catholic and Protestant interpretations of justification is this issue of the righteousness the righteousness or the justice by which we are made just in the eyes of God is that an external justice an external righteousness that inheres or is possessed by another by an alien to us namely Jesus Christ or does that righteousness penetrate into us such that it becomes ours. And on that basis of being ours, truly, we appear on, under the examination um, and under the calculation of God as truly righteous. So the, again, the, what Luther came to see is necessary for this, um, and what certainly Calvin began to see as necessary from this, and uh, even more poignantly, the, the later the later, the progeny of the reformers, uh, especially the Calvinists and the Puritans, um, began to understand that that the righteousness defining the locus of that imputed righteousness is the crux of the debate on this issue. And so again, Protestants see that the righteousness of Christ not every Protestant saw it this way, because we see some of the early commentaries of Calvin where he can kind of use a different nuance for what righteousness of God means. Some In some of his commentaries, like, for example, on Romans 4, he's willing to just define it as the forgiveness of sins, because there's some sort of a, uh equation there made by the citation of uh, Psalm 32 by St. Paul. But nevertheless, uh, in other places, he is unmistakable that the righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, meaning the righteousness that Jesus Christ merited in his own human life and in his obedient death on the cross. He merited uh, by active and passive obedience a righteousness which, which um, can be then imputed to us. It remains in Christ, so it, it remains external to us but it gets imputed to us, meaning legally credited to us, such that when God calculates our position as a result of this transaction, he looks at us and calculates the precise righteousness of Jesus. So he doesn't look at my sin, he doesn't look at my he doesn't look at my own righteousness, which is often defined, you know, as filthy rags, which that's, you know, there's a sense in which that's true for the pre-conversion life. Um, but the Protestant would say, even after conversion, God doesn't look at your sins. He doesn't look at your righteous deeds, the good works that you were foreordained in Christ to do, like Ephesians 2, uh, verses 8 through 11 say. None of that. God does not take that into, into his calculation. Um uh, of in the act of justification all that's put to the side all that he looks at is this 
credited alien righteousness of Jesus, which is only counted to me, is not possessed by me in the gift of justification. Whereas Catholics would say that that is, that is totally insufficient. Um, as scripture and tradition bear out, this righteousness actually inheres in us through baptismal regeneration, such that our souls, even without works, at that moment of baptism, our soul truly becomes righteousness. It, I mean, it doesn't mean what I meant by that is it, it's infused with righteousness, such that we are now a righteous soul cleansed from the filth of sin, cleansed of original sin, all actual sins. And we are, uh, there is planted within us a new disposition to love God above all things. This is what the theologians would call sanctifying grace, which is an elevated elevation of our nature to the supernatural, where we are, um, the, 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 the human virtues of faith, hope, and love are supernaturalized to become theological virtues such that we, lo we love God above all things and we hope in God above all things and, um, and that we believe in God um, and, and who cannot lie. And so that's, that's the difference, okay? But here in this text in Romans 1, 16 through 17, we already see some evidences that what Paul means by righteousness is something more than this purely alienated extranos legal righteousness that only remains in Jesus. And we see that because he says the gospel of Christ is, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, uh, some things I wanted to point out in the uh, Greek of this text in Romans uh, 1 16 is that uh, the power of God, do not me scar theu, power of God uh, is if, for those who are believing. So it is the power of God for those who are, to those who believe. So in the English, it says to those who believe, but in the Greek, it says, to those who are pistuo pistuanti or pis pis pisteunti, which is a present active participle, which modifies pisteos, which is faith, as a present active believing. So it actually should say literally that the gospel of that, that the gospel is the power of God to salvation, to everyone who is presently believing. That's, that's actually very similar to another passage in sacred scripture uh, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, um, which uh, says in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, it says the preaching of the cross, so that's the gospel, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us who are being saved, or to, to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Um, so, and, and in that case, it's a present passive partic participle. Um, so, it could be used either way, you know, but it's still present tense. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And uh, uh, those of you who are already astute Paul readers of Paul, you'll know that later on in that very chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul defines the power of God as the wisdom of God, and then he further elaborates on the wisdom of God as righteousness, dikaiosune, sanctification, and redemption. And so justification language is very much bound up in this uh, as an effect of the power of God. Now, when Paul uses power of God in relation to salvation, he more often not, than not is referring to something that is transforming. And uh, I'll show you by another 
verse in sacred scripture, Ephesians 1, um, Ephesians 1, 19. So let me take us there in the Bible gateway, Ephesians 1. There we go. All right. Here's a, a set, section in Ephesians 1 that I'm going to read, and you're going to see how well it, uh, it, it, can, it further interprets for us what power of God means in Romans 1. So I'll start at verse. Uh, I'll, I'll start at verse seventeen. This is a, one of the prayers of Paul. That uh, quote: "That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His." power toward us who believe and then he's going to define this according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and dominion and might and that every name or in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. All right, so let's go back to Romans 1. So, but you could see from that um, that the power of God to us who believe uh, is the very same power that God the Father, as you know, obviously, theologically, you know, an ad extra act action of one person of the Trinity is equal for all three, but we could speak of it in this way that God raised up. He gave through this. So through his mighty power, he brought new life into the corpse of Christ in the tomb and raised him up from death. Okay. So when Paul is talking about the saving dunamis power of, of God, he is talking about resurrection power. This isn't just some vague notion of God's mighty right hand. This is a very specific power. It's a power to raise men from the dead. And in the motif of New Testament soteriology, raising us from the dead is always inextricably tied to the gift of regeneration so i'm going to say here without giving too much proof that what paul has in mind here in romans 1 16 is regeneration it is the power of god the re resurrecting regenerating power of god to salvation for everyone who is believing for the jew first and also for the greek and then he bases a reason, he, he bases this in a further reason um, with the word for here. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So here is this important phrase, the dikaya sune theu, that, uh, that Martin Luther caught, his eye caught attention of. The justice of God or the righteousness of God is revealed. And the word for revealed there can mean uncovered or manifested. It's manifested and uh, ek, this, the, the word here, the preposition here, from faith, ek, out from faith, into faith, from faith to faith. I take it as just basically highlighting the, the finality and the the fullness of faith in relation to how it manifests the righteousness of God. Uh, several exegetes have commented on what this could mean. There's many options. In fact, uh, Reformed theologian John Murray, the late John Murray, um, his commentary on Romans has, he's, he's a Presbyterian, but um, he's got a, a, you know, a, 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 a historical outline on the history of exegesis on, on what that could mean from faith to faith. But uh, suffice it to say, almost all the exegetes understand that this means. Um, well, not I, I should I should back up. 
Okay, there's been some several developments in Pauline scholarship in the last three decades. I don't want to speak on behalf of all the different new perspectives on this on the, uh, the commentaries on this passage, but um, I'm pretty sure that uh, some of the new new perspective guys are going to want to take a different lead on this faith to faith. But the way I understand it here is that it's just faith, like the it's faith to faith, like out of faith into faith, meaning faith altogether as the fullness. And then uh, Paul appeals to an Old Testament text, the just shall live by faith, coming from Habakkuk 2.4, which means the just man shall live by faith. So this passage is teaching us that by faith we are made, we are made righteous in some way. Uh, we are righteous in the eyes of God through faith. That's what this passage is saying. So Luther caught on, okay? But the, the question is, what what does righteousness of God mean? Like R.C. Sproul was apt to ask. Righteousness of God occurs in another place in the New Testament outside of Paul. Of course, I don't want to go outside of Paul to define something that's in within his writing, but um, even Protestant exegetes, for example, like uh, Dr. Uh, Douglas Moo, his commentary on James, he even sees... Uh, a, a connection here between the righteousness of God as James uses it and the way Paul uses it. Um, so I'm going to read here James 1, verses 19 to 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, the reason why I go to this is not because I want to somehow take, uh, you know, uh, James as the interpreter of Paul. Okay, obviously, we got to read Dikaiosune and its different usages in Paul. Dik the, the verb Dikaiosune oh, and, and the noun Dikaiosune. Um, but you, I, I come here because it's it's there's some theological significance to, to this that I wanted to to bring out here. And that is that James here is talking about um, having control over the tongue. And if you have control over the tongue, uh, you have control over your, your, your whole person. Right. And if you don't, you know, if you're quick to, if you're quick to speak, quick to wrath, you have a short fuse, in other words, um, you produce uh, you produce sin. There's a, cer there's a certain ugly sinfulness of wrath, man's wrath, when someone's quick to it. And uh, James is calling men to 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 do the opposite: be swift to hear, meaning be quick to hear, as the proverbs and all the wisdom literature had taught hitherto. Um, a righteous man considers what considers before he speaks but in this case it's it's instead of being swift to use the tongue in anger be swift to use the ear to hear and discern slow to wrath and then he says because for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of god and here's the theological point i wanted to make righteousness of god okay to theu there at the end of god that's in that's the the genitive case. It could mean the genitive of possession. In that case, the righteousness of God would be one of His eternal attributes. Okay, but it can't mean that here, because if it's eternal, it's not produced, and if it's eternal, it's certainly not produced by a man, right? So it can't be the genitive of case. So could it be or a genitive case of possession? So could it mean the genitive case of origin? In other words, righteousness from God or the righteousness which is of God, but from God is, is really what we're trying to get at. And I, I think that's what it has to mean. Um, some theologians, I mean, some theologians take this as an activity, like the righteousness of God, meaning his righteous redeeming activity of salvation. 
uh, and that's possible. But and, and, and some exegetes interpret the phrase in Romans as the uh, activity of God. I take the more traditional interpretation. I actually think Luther got onto the right footing. The more the more patristic reading, um, at least in the Augustinian tradition anyway, is that this is the justice or righteousness by which God makes us just and righteous. But but what we want to see here is the the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So it doesn't bring a cause for the effect of the righteousness of God in the human who is being wrathful. So it stands to reason that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Well, that the, what's the opposite of wrath? Well, in this context, we could say mercy. Okay, the mercy of man uh, is, is possible. Uh, the kindness of man, the love of man, uh, does produce the righteousness of God. This is one of the reasons why in the catechism the uh, it's defined, righteousness of God as justifying is defined not just as the forgiveness of sins, but also the rectitude of divine love. So the soul gets rectified so that the soul is disposed to uh, give itself to God um, in charity, okay? As well as to give itself to your fellow man as the second of the, of the two great commandments. So this is interesting, isn't it? I mean, so we have a text in the New Testament which uses this phrase, even in the genitive case, uh, as something describing uh, true holiness within a human being. And so it's rather interesting. Um, I don't want my uh, reformed readers to think that I'm trying to make a, a drop, you know, like a knock down, drag them out refutation to uh, reformation exegesis of Dikaya Sune Tuthe U, but I thought it was interesting just to observe that that's how James interpreted the righteousness of God. And it just so happens that if it, it kind of follows in Paul, if you have the power of God to salvation being what I said it was, what he defines it as in Ephesians 1, as the, the righteousness of God that raises man from the dead, uh, Ephesians 2 actually even defines it further, where we were once dead in sins and trespasses, but he made us alive. And, and that's not just uh, a vague notion of being made alive. Once again, it's a very specific thing. It's actually our participation in the transition of Jesus Christ from natural human life to a dead body, the corpse in the tomb, to the, the new, resurrected, glorified human form. So we actually participate in those transitions with saint with with Christ our lord and and paul paul uh, ex explains this further in his epistle to the romans in romans 6 for example where he talks about us joining christ in his crucifixion burial and resurrection okay and the effect of that is the righteousness of god so the, uh, there's just some observations to, to take note of here that tips the needle in favor of a Catholic Orthodox reading of Romans 117, which would certainly be contrasted with uh, the later Lutheran uh, dictum on the righteousness being alien from us, outside of us in Christ alone, and only imputed to us in the gift of justification. Okay, so uh, let, let's go further um, to look at this passage, that the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? And how is it used elsewhere in the New Testament? So I'm actually going to take us to uh, another spot in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Um, let's see. I think it's Hebrews 10. 
Let's see. Uh, yes, Hebrews 10. So if you could see here with me, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we don't know who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. A lot of church fathers thought it was Paul. Um, there's some reasons for that, some reasons to doubt that. Um, but I like Pauline authorship theory, so I'll just say St. Paul wrote it. But uh, he wrote it to the Hebrews who were discerning. Uh, they were capitulating to persecution and things like that uh, and, and, and growing in certain theological doubt of the, uh, of the gospel and of the new covenant in Christ. And they were returning to the old covenant. So these are Jews who are basically teetering on apostasy. And um, Paul, Paul tells them to recall their former days. So here, let's look at verse 32. This is Hebrews 10, uh, quote, But recall the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who so treated. For you had compassion on me and my chains. That's one of the reasons why many people thought it was Paul. Uh, you had compassion on me and my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And then he quotes here from Habakkuk. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Notice, notice this. Notice what it says here. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, so drawing back is the contrast of live by faith. So faith and drawing back, meaning backsliding away from God, from from faith and hope in His plan, and, and going into apostasy. Um, God has no pleasure in the one who draws back. It stands to reason if living by faith here is the opposite of drawing back away from God. Living by faith ha means drawing, being drawn towards God and causing God to have pleasure upon the one who believes. So what we have here is a God-pleasing virtue in this word faith. Okay, Paul goes on in verse 39, but we are not of we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. So obviously the opposite of drawing back, which is drawing near. Interestingly enough, James also talks about uh, this idea of drawing near to God. Cleanse your hands, uh, purify your hearts, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Resist the devil, and God will draw near to you. So this drawing towards God, coming to God through faith, has to be a God-pleasing virtue, which we understand that faith in and of itself is a kind of virtue, but it's, it's God-pleasing in this sense, in this New Testamental sense, when it is formed by another virtue we call charity. Okay, and this is why, if uh, you you read some of the, uh, if you read some of the uh, scholastics like Aquinas, like for example uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, just let, let's just go to him because if the reformers read him, I think that they may have seen there was no reason to go as far as they did with this idea of the of the histusio dei, the righteousness or justice of God being an alien, being permanently alien. Uh, in the gift of justification. Charity form the the charity forming faith, which is faith formed by charity. 
when the, the Pope Benedict the Sixteenth even said that we could almost, I mean, we could actually agree with Martin Luther's uh, modification of Romans three twenty eight, where he said in this German Bible that therefore we are not justified by the works of the law, but by faith alone. So Pope Benedict the Sixteenth and one of his uh, and one of his audience. Uh, uh, that his addresses that he gave in a public audience, he said that Martin Luther is right to add the word alone there. If we can understand that the faith that's being talked about is not just this pure and unaccompanied, unformed idea of intellectual assent, pure intellectual assent, which for my Lutheran readers, for my Calvinistic readers, None of the good Reformed theologians ever interpreted it that way when it comes to saving repentant faith. Um, so Pope Benedict said that we could say that we're justified by faith alone if we're talking about a faith that is formed by charity. In other words, you have the faith as, as it being seen as an instrument of justification, but it's it's got a certain shape to it. It's the kind of faith that's accompanied with repenting love of God. It's, it's a faith that draws the person to God in repentance. So like Abraham, when he came to God, he did not just believe the facts about the promise of God. No, 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 no. He abandoned his all of his dreams and all of his plans with his life in Ur. Secondly, in Genesis 15, he he tried to procure the promise through Hagar. For those of you who are familiar with the Pauline literature uh, and with the the the, te the Mosaic text, you know that um, that Abraham tried to use his own works to procure um, the gift of a child through Hagar. And Paul actually uses that in Galatians 4 as an allegory for um, the, the excluded method of trying to be justified by the works of man, by the work, by human works. Okay. Abraham actually paradigmatically demonstrates what it looks like to produce the, the promise through works, through Hagar. But we know God rejected Ishmael. Okay. So God told Abraham, no, one of the children from Sarah will be, you know, it's the, from Sarah, your seed will come forth. And Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness because Abraham abandoned his methodology of works. And he came to believe and trust that God would do it through Sarah, even though she was physically and humanly speaking beyond the pop but beyond capable of having a child so um hebrews hebrews here uh for what i'm trying to say here hebrews is a remedy for the catholic protestant debate on the word how to how to define uh pisteos uh faith in paul's language of Hebrews, uh, when he quotes Habakkuk 2.4, that's what I'm trying to drive at here. We see here in Hebrews that um, saving faith is a repentant, obedient faith, which is something that all the reformers could admit, it, interestingly enough. Um, there's some several theological qualifications that prevent them from seeing this as a bridge to Catholic and Tridentine theology. I don't have time to elucidate and all that. Uh, you, if you do, if you're interested, you can go listen to a, a previous uh, dialogue I had with a, a uh, post grad student at Trinity Evangelical School named Sean Sean Luke. Uh, I think it's like ten or so videos ago. Uh, I think it's titled just Protestant Catholic Dialogue on Justification. And we kind of go into more of the differences here, especially with uh, Romans and the text exegesis of Romans. But, but what I'm trying to say here is that Hebrews and 
and the further elaboration on, on Habakkuk 2.4 helps us, given the canonical coherence of the New Testament, you know, we could use this to interpret Paul, I would argue, um, with the Habakkukian interpretation here in, in, in Hebrews, if you go back in Paul's letter to the Romans, all of a sudden now, uh, we can go back, let's go back to uh, Romans 1, the just. We go back to Romans 1, verse 16 through 17, we see here, now we can kind of read this a little differently. For in the for in it, so, so God, the gospel, the message of the cross, is the power of God. We saw that the power of God, dunamis, is is God's, not just some vague idea of God's influence on us, but a, a very specific resurrection, life-giving, tomb, grave-conquering power to raise man from the dead, which is regeneration. Power of God to salvation for everyone who is believing, present tense. And because in it the righteousness of God is revealed, righteousness of God meaning Something as as I would say, James one talks about it's an it's an inward holiness, um, in addition to the forgiveness of sins. Quite obviously, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So basically, through faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And this actually corresponds very well if we go back to Habakkuk himself. So if we go to the book of Habakkuk here. Uh, okay, Habakkuk. Sorry, my uh, computer's acting up here. If you can hear me, just Give me a moment. For some reason, I'm having some technical difficulties. Hey, um, I'm back. <laughs> uh, can anybody who's watching confirm that they see me back here? I don't know. Uh, I see some of the people in the comments here saying that uh, I was frozen. That might have been the case. Can anyone hear me now? Uh, yes. Okay, you can see me. Uh can you hear me? Okay, so I got confirmation I, that I can be seen and heard. Anyhow, I don't know exactly where I was frozen. <laughs> I don't know when I began to be frozen. So unfortunately, I may have some of my presentation uh, which escapes uh, the listeners. I am sorry. I... Uh, 
did not want to do that. Um, so let me share my screen again to where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to Habakkuk himself and, and show you how Paul's interpretation of Habakkuk has to match what uh, Habakkuk himself was trying to say. So let me share my screen. Okay, so I'm here. All right, Habakkuk 2.4. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, here we go, Habakkuk 2.4. Behold the proud... His soul is not upright in him. Talking about externos or, um, or whether it's internal. The interior of the proud man is not right. But, in contrast, the just shall live by his faith. So, this is... Uh, I won't go into the background of Habakkuk, but there's an impending judgment and, an, and a, 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 basically a forecast of judgment and, and future salvation. And uh, Habakkuk is told that the proud, which is basically somebody who doesn't maintain their trust and reliance and their, their giving their full person over to God's plan for their life, that is the proud man. That person is not, is not upright in him. In other words, he does not have the justice of God. Like James says, the wrath of man. Well, we could say the wrath of man does not produce the, the justice of God. We could say here the pride of man, likewise, does not produce the, the righteousness of God. But the just shall live by faith. So faith produces the righteousness of God. Which, again, uh, the Catholic Church has always interpreted that as the forgiveness of sins, and the internal rectif rectification of the soul, the rectitude of divine love. Okay, so uh, what we have here is, uh, if we go back to Romans 1, and I'll just kind of rehearse this, because I'm not sure if I froze uh, when I was talking about this, but we come back to Romans 1.16, and we, we read, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. We define power of God, dunamis, as not just some vague idea of God's influence in our lives, but a very specific kind of power, very specific kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of a, uh, a transition that he causes in our lives. It's, 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 it matches the, the, the transition that God caused in the life of Christ namely from his tomb, from the grave, to new resurrection life. So this power of God is a regenerating, resurrecting power. To us who believe, it's a saving saving power because it delivers us from the death of the soul that we have in Adam. Um, and then it, the reason why this is the result is because the gospel, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as a as, uh, you know, we define that as righteousness, meaning the the forgiveness of sins. So all of our all of our sins are forgiven, but then also our soul is renewed interiorly. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk two four. We saw from Hebrews that this is definitely uh, it has to do with uh, the, the justice that is in hearing in us. Um, you'll recall in Hebrews ch uh, chapter three and four, um, the, the 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 author to the Hebrews says that the the original Israelites that were taken out of Egypt, they weren't able to enter into the promised land because they lacked faith. They did not enter because of unbelief. Okay. And then it, it, it spurs the current readers. Uh, beware, brethren, that you do not have an evil heart of unbelief. That's Hebrews 3 and 4. Well, if there's the existence of the evil heart of unbelief, then the opposite has to exist, which is, um, the good heart of belief, again, which is a one of the th three theological virtues that Catholic, Catholics believe is infused in us. 
through this regenerating power of God. All right. So all right, I want to end here with going to Romans 4, just giving a few comments on Romans 4, because I'm certain that my Lutheran and Protestant listeners are saying, Eric, you're just not getting it, man. <laughs> There's so much within Romans, especially Romans 3 and 4 and 5. There's rich and gold proof for extra nos imputation. I'm sorry, I'm not able to go through all that. However, if you really want to see what I have to say about that, um, I recommend you get uh, my book on uh, The Just Shall Live by Faith, which is available on Amazon in hardcover, paperback, or Kindle. All right, Romans 4. This is, this is the text that uh, Protestants l l think that um, basically the whole debate is, is basically resolved. Um, with victory towards the, the Protestants. Um, because here, Paul, Paul seems to exclude all works from justification and um, leaving only space for faith. Okay, so let me read this to you. What then, this is Romans 4, verse 1, what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Okay. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. All right, so we have what looks to be a very strong section of Holy Scripture that supports, number one, the dichotomic opposition between faith and works. Um, we have to see that. I don't think we can avoid that. Okay. We also see that on the side of works, it's wholly excluded, totally excluded, making only space for faith. And that is the means by which man is justified. All right. So, there's a bit of a problem here for the Catholic because if if works are entirely excluded, then it's there's only room for faith. And if there's only room for faith by this very logical exclusivity, then it has to be by faith alone. Okay, but let's take our time here with this. The first question that is asked is what then shall we say Abraham our father has found according to the flesh for if Abraham was justified by works he has something to boast about so justification by works and boasting for Paul are synonymous if a man is if a man boasts before God it's because He's justified by works. That's clear, okay? But but we also know that there's other places in Paul where he tells us that our lives are obedient, and yet we can't boast in in before God, as if to as if to. Um, be self-righteous, all right? And I want to go to a, a section in Romans 2 where we could see that. Romans 2, verses 25 to 29, Paul says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man, so keep your keep your finger on that. If an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, 
will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Remember, Paul said, what did Abraham, our father, find according to the flesh? So outwardly. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So here we have a, a proof in Paul's own reasoning that you can have somebody who's not circumcised, they keep the righteous requirements of the law, okay, they fulfill the law, and yet they cannot boast in their own flesh because it's because it's saying it's not, nor is circumc circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who's one inwardly. So there's an inward holiness that characterizes this uncircumcised person, and yet he is not permitted to do what Paul said a person can do who's justified by works, namely boast before God and his own goodness. Because this circumcision is of the heart performed by the Holy Spirit, not in the letter. In the letter, you have you have the divine activity on rocks. In the, in the New Covenant, you have the divine activity on human hearts. Who, and, and as a result, our praise is not from men, neither from ourselves, neither from other men, but from God. So if we go back to Romans 4, I think that helps. Uh, if we go back to Romans 4. And now we can read what this means here. What has Abraham found according to the flesh as an outward an outward reality, an outward work, basically? If Abraham did something, you know, that uh, in his flesh that would justify him by his works, then he would have something to boast about. And then it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what does it mean for Abraham to believe God? Well, let's go further along in Romans uh, Romans 4 and see what Abraham's belief in God meant and how it relates to this crediting or imputation of, of righteousness. So Romans chapter uh, 4, verse 8 to 17, or 16. Let's see it from 16. Um, actually, we'll start at uh, Faith of Abraham, 16c. The faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Who, contrary to hope, in hope believed. So we have another virtue here, hope. In hope believed. So in hope, so hope has a forming, uh, a shaping influence on faith. So in hope, Abraham believed so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And here we go. Not being weak in faith, meaning he was strong in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Okay, so the, the, there's an evil here that Abraham avoided. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. So faith actually has 
it, it, it adapts. It can either grow weak or it can grow in strength. But with strength in, in faith, giving glory to God. Here goes, here goes back to that issue that Habakkuk 2.4 was talking about where the soul of the proud man is not right, but the soul of the just is upright. It's a God-pleasing virtue, giving glory to God and being fully convinced, Abraham was, fully convinced that what he had promised, he also was able to perform. And look at this. This is the key verse right here. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Paul telling us what he understands about Genesis 15, 6. This citation that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. It was accounted to him for righteousness in some sense because of the intrinsic value of what was in Abraham. And not just what was not in Abraham but what was in Jesus Christ alone. Now, some Protestants have gotten around this by saying, well, Paul's just talking about the definition of the kind of faith that serves as an instrument that gives us this extra nos, alien righteousness that permanently is possessed by Christ alone. But that's just not very outstanding in this passage. What we see here is God, or I'm sorry, St. Paul telling us, well, God is telling us through St. Paul, that Abraham had some walkable virtue in this passage of Genesis 15. Okay? He contrary to hope, in hope he believed. So hope is a virtue. Okay, we if we grow, if we lose hope, if we become hopeless, for example, no longer have hope in God, that's one of the first steps towards the ungodly life. Having hope in God is the is one of the first helps towards living a, a good life. So in hope, Abraham believed. And so as a result of this, he didn't grow weak in faith. He wasn't like the Israelites in the desert who grew weak in faith you know they weren't getting as much food as they wanted they weren't getting as much drink as they wanted they weren't um they weren't seeing uh you know exciting uh contrast to the egyptian time of slavery they they might they say we might as well go back to egypt you know the author to the Hebrews says that they lacked faith. They had an evil heart of unbelief. Abraham, in contrast to that, here grows strong in faith. He did not waver at the promise of God. So you have to ask yourself, what if somebody doesn't waver at the promise of God, but grows strong in faith, giving glory to God, is that something that pleases God? Of course it does. Of course it does. Didn't our Lord tell some of the, the people that he met over and over again that their faith had saved them, right? What well, think of the centurion can the, the centurion who, who said um, that Christ, that he was not worthy that Christ should enter under his roof, but that by saying the word, as we say in the mass, is saying um, say the word only and our soul shall be healed. If you if you could just say the word, Jesus. His daughter would be healed. And, and Christ said, there is not, this man had more faith than all of Israel. So this faith, okay, that Abraham had, it's shaped by a drawing influence to God. It refuses to go along with our own plan, with, as Habakkuk said, our own pride, with what we could see with our eyes, with an explanation that can only be understood and discerned through objectivity, like Thomas, who needed to feel the wounds of Christ. Jesus said, blessed are those who, be who believe but have not seen. These are people who are drawn to God regardless of it being against hope, meaning contrary to what would seem hopeful. 
and yet they give glory to God. That's what Abraham's doing here. He gives glory to God. He refuses to go with his plan. He goes with God's plan. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. You see? So if we go back to Romans 4, uh, where it says, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted for righteousness. This, this believing here, is a God-pleasing virtue. And the righteousness that's accredited to Abraham, okay, is truly righteousness. It's righteousness that comes out of faith. God does this by mercy. No, no and this is a, one of the issues that Sean, Luke, and I had in our dialogue is a Protestant rightly says, well, if the righteousness that Abraham had is deserving of you know, if the if the faith that Abraham had is deserving of the the, the label righteousness, then this is a one to one transaction. There is no grace involved, right? But and, and so that would contradict the very next statement. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But further down below, Paul ta Paul describes Abraham's walk with the Lord in faith. And then grounds that as the reason why his faith is, is reckoned for righteousness. Is Paul like contradicting himself? In other words, is, is Abraham's walk of faith basically his walk of works? And the answer is no. Okay, Nowhere in Abraham's life do you have this kind of fleshly working unassisted with, without, you know, being a, without the assistance, assistance of grace. Um, obtaining justice in the eyes of God through faith. It's always, it's always Abraham operating through and by the impulse of God's grace. And with that assistance, the wages are counted as grace, never as debt. If it was traceable to Abraham alone, then yeah, it would be counted as debt. But it's not. It's traceable to God. It's traceable to God because God is the one who, through the believing person, is in himself making the man righteous. And we see that as we go into the next verses here, because David describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, and then he describes repentance. He describes a person who repents. Okay. So the, the effect of repentance is forgiveness, but because there's also repentance involved. Okay, so this, you know, when somebody repents of their sin, they turn away from sin. They turn to God. That's what we're talking about, faith being formed by charity. This is, uh, this is what leads to forgiveness. Now, if you read the book of Acts over and over again, um repent and you will be you will be forgiven right repent and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the holy spirit and the remission of sins acts 236 to 38 um so we see that what paul's describing here is a transformation that takes place in the human through grace and faith principally not by some outward action like circumcision and we know that because later on in the very same chapter, Paul grounds the imputation of Abraham's faith as righteousness on these virtuous qualities um, of faith. And in my book, I actually catalog some of the interpretations of the church fathers on Genesis 15, 6 and Romans 4. Quite shocking because a lot of the post-reform theologians that were Lutherans, like Martin Chemnitz uh, and uh, Johann Gerdos and, and other other re reform Protestant theologians, they went to statements in Chrysostom and Ambrose and Jerome and Augustine that where they talk about faith alone and they you know. Genesis 15, 6. But if you read some of those citations, and I, I give them in full throughout my book, they understand that the, the accounting of faith as righteousness is real. It's not unreal. 
It doesn't make faith simply an instrument through which an alien righteousness is recognized to the person. Rather, faith itself participates in the shaping of the human as a righteous person in the eyes of God. All right. So that's what I would say about Romans uh, chapter four. And there's much more to say, but I don't have time. We're going on an hour and 30 minutes. And uh, I'm not going to take any questions this time, but I appreciate you all watching. Uh, again, if you could please uh, like the video, subscribe if you haven't, share in your social media. Please help me to reach, uh, uh, reach uh, a wider audience. That would be great. And if you could look at the show notes, I had the book recommendations that I gave about indulgences in purgatory because nobody could talk about Reformation Day uh, without mentioning those issues. And uh, also don't forget uh, young baby Dryden, who is suffering and fighting from cancer. Um, he, he's, he's responded well, like I said at the beginning, but the, the Stewart family needs all the help they can get. If you can pray for them, please pray for them. If you have an excess um, and you, you, you are capable of uh, helping them financially, the GoFundMe link is there in the show notes as well. Uh, and to, to do anything that the Lord puts on your heart to help this particular family. I've known them for years. Uh, uh, they're precious Catholics and they love Christ. And, and they, they, they are struggling through this, but they are responding well to this trial. All right, everybody. So please leave any comments you want and um, interact with anything I've said. I just ask that you would keep to the rule that our Lord gave us. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For such is the law and the prophets. All right. God bless everybody.